We hear that? There we go. I said Happy New Year's Eve. Everybody ready? New Year's Eve. Woo! Thanks for coming to celebrate New Year's Eve with us. Uh, this is uh, kind of as we close out the year, we think back on this holiday week. It was kind of a slow week. How's everybody's Christmas? Was good? Everybody get a, raise your hand if you got a gift you're really excited about. Really excited about. Anybody? Nice. Have you ever gotten a gift you weren't excited about? You ever gotten a gift that you just didn't like at all? And, and how do you handle that? Like, do you have a good poker face? If you tear open a gift that you just think, I already have one of these or I will never, ever in my life use this gift. Uh, how do you deal with that? When you, when you rip it open, are you, do you fake it? Like, oh man, and what do you say about a horrible gift without lying? Oh man, that is something. That is really something. Look at it. It's, it's a gift. I can't wait to re-gift. Uh, you know, uh, uh, how many of you have ever re-gifted? Be honest. Who's re-gifted? Okay, good. So it didn't go to waste. Uh, but you know, in the moment, it's tricky if you don't like the gift or you never know you won't use it or it's just not practical. And some people, it's just gift giving is not their gift, okay? Uh, on the, or, or maybe they're just not thoughtful. But do you know... Uh, the, the idea of it, you know, for, I don't know how it became a tradition in my house, but my son Murphy one year thought it'd be funny to wrap up stuff from the cupboard and give it to people. So you'd open a gift and be like, oh, Frosted Flakes, half-eaten half box, thank you. And ever since then, he does that every year. You'll open a gift. You never can be sure. It's something from the cupboard. And of course, this year, again, multiple people got gifts. Actually, he just picked my one oldest daughter, Courtney, and gave her all the special gifts from the cupboard that we already owned. And we can laugh about it, it was easy to do, but uh, you know, it's different though than a practical joke gift. When somebody gives something on purpose that's kinda not a good gift. Let me just tell you, the worst gift I ever received, I do know this gift. Uh, how many of you have a fear of snakes, anybody? How about spiders? Don't, don't like spiders? Okay. Uh, I happened to, my sophomore year of college, I, I uh, was with my friend Andy. We went and met these two new girls at school, and they seemed really nice, nice enough. We got in this conversation of things you don't like, fears, and so forth. And for some weird reason, uh, we saw those girls the next day, and they were like, hey, we got you guys something. And we were at the lunchroom table, I'll never forget, and they brought us a bag, and it was rolled shut and stapled. And they said, you guys have to pull it open at once. Pull it open. And we pulled this paper bag open, and these creepy girls went and collected live spiders. I'm not kidding. And, and when we tore that bag open, uh, the spiders ran out, and like a couple of little sissy, me and my friend jumped up like, ah, and we ran away, and they laughed, and I never spoke to those girls again. <laughs> now, I, I, I know spiders are necessary to eat the bugs. It's good, but I just don't want them in my, in my house or on me, and that is just kind of my deal. But it was a bad gift, Right? You know, uh, you might say, Will, where are you going with this? What's this got to do with the message? It has everything to do with it. This isn't actually my illustration. It's, it's Jesus' illustration. When he said, uh, if you being sinful people know how to give good gifts to your kids, why would you ever think your heavenly father who loves you would give you a bad gift? I mean, anybody get a scorpion in their stocking? No. It'd be a horrible job. And that's the illustration. You wouldn't get a scorpion. He wouldn't give you a, a poisonous snake. He wouldn't give you a rock, although in the 1970s, some genius guy found a way to sell pet rocks and make money off of it. But no good parent gives those dark gifts, gives wrong gifts or hurtful gifts to their kid. They don't do it. And he said, neither would your heavenly father who loves you. His very essence is love. He would never do that for you. You might say, what's that got to do with us ending the year in the future? It has everything to do with our future. Your picture, your understanding of a loving God and Father who cares for you and has your very best interest at heart has everything to do with how you and I trust him with decisions. If you think he's out to get you like, oh man, if I trust him with that, I'm probably gonna walk through a really difficult trial. Well, when you walk through trials, is he with you? Yeah. Does he know what's best for you? Yeah. I mean, do you ever stop? Does, does he consult with you? You know, when we consider, I, I thought before we kind of consider the past, we, the, the, excuse me, the way ahead, we'd stop and first consider uh, the past. And so I asked for this whiteboard up here. Hopefully you guys over there can see it. Uh, but with this uh, uh, dry erase board, uh, I would just um, stop and say, imagine, uh, by illustration, think of the children of Israel. And they, they started out, we, we, we pick up the story in Egypt, and it e represents Egypt, and they're right here. And they started to cry out to God because what was their occupation in Egypt? Anybody know? 
They were slaves. It's not a good occupation. If you had a really attractive daughter, Pharaoh's going to probably take him in his harem. If you had a really strong son, he's probably going to the military or he's going to carry heavy bricks and build pyramids for a living. I mean, if you don't have any choice when you're a slave. And nobody's excited about that. And yet, that's their occupation. They start to cry out to God and say, do you love us? Are you a loving father? Set us free from this situation. And that's where we pick up in Exodus where the scripture tells us because God's loving, he heard their prayers and he sent, he picked a guy, Moses, who was a murderer, by the way. And he picks Moses and sends him out and without going into all the stuff involved in Moses' decision, he sends them to, to after, after a, lot of, a long conversation, he finally convinces Moses to trust him in faith and go to Pharaoh and tell Pharaoh the unpopular message, let your free labor force go. Let him go. Pharaoh doesn't like it. But imagine we take that account and we flip it all around. It says the Lord uh, hardened Pharaoh's heart. But imagine he didn't. Imagine for a minute that first meeting that Moses had with Pharaoh, he just said, okay, go. You guys go. Go, get out, get out, get out. What, what would the story, how would that have read? Not very exciting, right? I mean, you never get to see God flex his muscles. But God hardens Pharaoh's heart and then they hit these, these uh, you know, I'll just put a T here for, that represents trials. Somebody's gonna come in late and be like, E.T., why are we talking about that? Uh, you know, um, th this idea of trials that start to hit, God allows these trials, and when uh, Moses starts making demands, Pharaoh decides to make it more difficult for God's people, and he says, you know what, I'm gonna take out one key ingredient to your brick making. I'm gonna take straw out and say, still make the bricks without straw. And now the people start to complain. First, they were excited. God sent a deliverer and that Moses uh, told them that God, the loving God, heard their prayers. But now, when the trials hit, when they realize it's not an easy road out of Egypt, they start to complain. And God allows not just one, not just frogs, not just locusts, not just boils, not just uh, the river turning uh, blood red, but he actually allows 10 trials that finally softened Pharaoh's heart enough to say, you can go, get out. Not only does he say, go, but he says, you can take some of our stuff. You can take some of our plunder for nothing, for doing nothing. Just go. Was that not amazing? God showed his power. And what he was doing there, he was flexing his muscle to say, when you guys are out here in the wilderness, so, so trials come, then there's the plagues, and God's showing his power, and then he finally releases them, and they head out into this area of the wilderness. And God's saying, I have this plan for your life. I'm sending you to the promised land. It's gonna be unbelievable, because I wanna bless you, because I'm a good father, and I give you good gifts, and I have an amazing plan for your future. Do you trust me? And they all like, yeah, yeah, we got to go. And they got, they got gold, they got all this booty, and they're now on their little caravan, and they're making their way. And then they hit this thing right here, the Red Sea. And when they hit the Red Sea, they're like, wait a second, how are we gonna get around this thing? Because it's in right in line before we get to the promised land. This is a problem. And then the drama ensues as Pharaoh changed his mind. And he gets his army and says, man, let's go. I can't believe, where did I get, I, I gave away all my best stuff. Let's go get these guys. So then he gets his army, and as the children of Israel are right here, that's, that's their heads, a lot of them. And then uh, the armies are now coming, and there's, uh, there's the horse. And, uh, uh, and, and they're all coming, and, and they're marching. And the people start screaming. They're crying out like, no, 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 no. We're not gonna get through this. Right? They cry out. And then what is God doing? He wants to show them his power again. He wants to show them even more how much he loves them. So God makes a way and he busts this open, dry spot of land so they can bust right through the Red Sea, right? And they make their way through. But just as they're making, through, uh, making their way through, they see that Pharaoh decides he's coming too. And they start screaming out in terror again. And they get to the other side. And just then God decides, let's get rid of the open hole and let's swallow them up. Now you would think on the other side, they would stop and say, hold up, you know what God's done? 10 plagues to set us free. Look at all the stuff he gave us for the road. Look at what he just did right here. They don't. They get out here in the wilderness and they start to hit different trials because the promised lands, uh, you know, it, it doesn't come as quickly or as easily as they hoped. And when they get up right here to the border, imagine there's this door, God's saying, go through this door. 
But at the door, God sends 12 of his guys inside to go have a peek what's on the other side of the door. And the 12 go inside and they have a look. And when they get in there, they realize there's these gigantic people in there, okay? Giants, sons of Nephilim, we're told. And they get in there and they come back. And 10 of them say, dude, the people are too big. The, the land is good. God was, God was honest about that. It was really good. But there's giants, man. We're not getting in there. Two of the guys said, no, no, no. Two of the guys, what were their names? Tell the person next to you if you know them. Joshua and Caleb. Not a lot of people name their kids the other 10 guys. Uh, okay, but the two names, you, you know a lot of them. Okay, so these 10, these, I, I have this idea that Joshua and Caleb did one thing the other guys weren't doing. They remembered these things. Remember what God did with the plague? Remember what he did with the Red Sea? He's amazing. We can trust him. The other 10, all they saw were the giants. And it, it prohibited it from making it in the door. Now, I have this idea that life is a lot like the wilderness. What doors is God calling you to go through? I just picture in my life that there's times in my life that God has called me to walk through certain doors. There's times I haven't wanted to go. And, and, and let's just imagine in the wilderness that there's this big oval-like room. And there's the door God calls us through. And there's the door we've just come from. And as we're in this great big room and God says, I want you to go through that door. It, for some reason, the door always requires faith. It's never an easy door. There's always some giant or some trial or some situation that's gonna make it not easy to get through. Why is that? God wants us, wants us to see how much he loves us. He wants us to see his power. He wants to see there's nothing too great for him. That's why he says without faith, it's impossible to please him. He's only gonna give us a difficult door that requires him. So why do we always wait to go through the door? You know, you know, if you're like me, I usually look around the oval room and say, are there other doors? And sometimes you can find other doors. And I think of them like shortcuts, like, is there another way? Let's find another way. I wanna do another path, Lord. You know what's funny? God is a gentleman. He never shoves anybody through the door. Your choice. Your choice. I have this theory, uh, now that I'm 51 years old, that God lets us go through certain doors that maybe uh, uh, when we choose to not go through his door. And here's what I've learned. I believe there's like this corridor that leads back to this door. <laughs> and you go through this other way. And by the way, there's usually like difficulty in this way too. Like, what, did I, what was I thinking? And then you bust back in. You're like, I'm in the same room. <laughs> oh yeah, do you want to do the door now? You want to trust me now? Or, you know, here's the crazy thing about the Lord, because he's loving, because he's a gentleman, he'll let you live here forever. He created you for this place, but he'll let you live in the wilderness. He'll let you die there. Most of all the Israelites, except for Joshua and Caleb and the next generation, they're the only ones that got to go through the door. They're the only ones that's had a picture big enough of a loving God they were willing to trust him to go through. And as soon as that crowd dies off, and these are all, you know, tombstones, uh, the rest of the group gets to go through, and when they bust through and they go through that door, what's waiting on the other side? Oh, it's almost like you took the PL and you put the promised land back here. There are the giants, but there's also this thing called the Jordan River, right? Right, and they go, oh, we gotta cross through that. How are we getting through the Jordan? Uh, well, Joshua remembered what God did in the Red Sea, and he did the same thing, and God said, step in, and he didn't, say, he didn't dry it up and then say step like he did the Red Sea when, when Moses lifted his staff. This time he said step in. It says as they stepped, the river stopped. Sometimes we experience God's miraculous power when we move forward in faith. It's not after. It, it, it's a step forward now. It doesn't take faith if God shows you first. Right? It doesn't honor him if we wait until he shows us. And they step forward and it dries. It's, it's kind of like the 10 lepers. As they went, they were healed. So there's this process, and there's Joshua, and he goes through, and I wanna pick up right after they crossed through the uh, Jordan River. Uh, we, we see in Joshua chapter four, God said something to, to Joshua about that. He said, when all the nation had finished passing over the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, take 12 men from the people, from each tribe, a man, and command them, saying, take 12 stones from here out of the midst of the Jordan. One translation said, out of the deepest point in the Jordan. 
And it was at flood stage, by the way, at the time they were passing it. It says, from the very place the priests were standing firmly, and bring them over with you and lay them down to the place where you will lodge tonight. And then Joshua called the 12 men and the people from Israel, whom he had appointed, a man from each tribe. And Joshua said to them, pass on before the ark of the Lord, your God, into the midst of the Jordan, and take up each of you a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of tribes of the people of Israel, that this may be a sign among you when your children ask in time to come, what do you, uh, uh, excuse me, what, what, do you, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall tell them uh, that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord, and we had passed over the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan were cut off, and so the uh, stones shall be for the people of Israel a memorial forever. This idea of these stones that God said, set those up as a memorial. That's not the only place in scripture God told them to do that. He, he tells uh, Samuel later to take a stone when God showed his faithfulness and he calls it an Ebenezer and says, set it up to remember. There's a time when uh, Joshua and his people in uh, chapter six, Achan sinned and they piled stones up on Achan after he was uh, put to death because of his sin. They said, remember uh, lessons from the past, from mistakes you all have made as well. Remember, remember. Tell them, you can't forget this stuff. Because if we forget, we, we, we lose our picture of who God is. It's like the 12, disi uh, it's like the 12 disciples after they saw the miracle of, of the feeding of the 5,000, they go and after that is the miracle of the 4,000. You wait for one disciple to go, wait a second, we've done this before. Seriously, there was less people. I remember this. Jesus, can you do that thing? Like, nobody said that. They're like, what are we gonna do? I don't even know what we're gonna do. Hey, good question. I mean, it's easy to look at them when we have the hindsight of looking at scripture, but what are these doors like in your life? You know, I, a question, how many times have you seen God faithful, faithfulness in your life? How many prayers has he answered for you? Do you think we honor him or dishonor him when we fear the door? When you, have you ever known something? I'm pretty sure God wants me to go through this door. But you, you wait. I don't know. I'm gonna try another door. I'm just gonna wait. Hope it gets smaller and easier. How's that working out for you? You know, uh, the Lord is loving and he'll, he'll wait. He's patient. Uh, but this image of 12 stones, this idea of waiting, that God wants us to remember his faithfulness. He wants us to remember his faithfulness. Psalm 103, 8 to 12 says this, the Lord is compassionate and gracious. Do you believe that? Do you believe he loves you? He's never gonna put scorpions in your stocking. You're not getting a snake or spiders for Christmas. He loves you. He has a promised life for you. He says he is slow to anger. He's abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he arbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve. Isn't that great news? especially when the wages of sin is death. He says, he will not repay us according to our iniquities, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. He loves us. Isaiah says, uh, God wants to do a new thing in our lives. He says, remember not the former things, nor the things of old. Behold, I'm doing a new thing. He wants to do something new in our lives. But do we stop and remember what he's already done? Are we so quick to move forward or get comfortable where we are? I, a number of years ago, I've shown this thing before here, but I try to update this. This I call a faith board. I made this a number of years ago when I was kind of impressed by all these scriptures that talk about the 12 stones or the stones of remembrance. And I wanted to make a board that shows me things God's done in my life where he showed his faithfulness. I hang it up in my bathroom. It's right next to my mirror. I see it every day when I'm shaving my bald head. And so I'm there and I'm reminded why do I do this? So that next time God has another door in front of me and I'm afraid to go through it, I look at that and see he's so faithful. He has a track record that is 100% good. He's never let me down. I had one time when I left CFC and I was like, uh, I felt like God called us to live on faith and do missions and all this other stuff. I was terrified because that takes money and my, my uh, little package ran out after, uh, uh, of money ran out after three months. There was no more money coming. And I, and I looked at that date like it was the door, like, no way, I'm not gonna have money. And we sent a fundraising letter. I'm like, God, what are you gonna do? And I realized we had nothing and we stepped out in faith. We went out and I, and I went to do this mission deal. I said to my wife, when I get home, we're gonna be $5,000 short. 
She's, and Sandra is really good with trusting God with that stuff, and she just said, no, God's not gonna do that to us. I'm like, I, I thought he's gonna give us scorpions. I just feel it. It's gonna be bad. And I had people call him like, yeah, I sent you a check. And it was like 50 bucks, which, thank you. They all add up, but I was like, 50 won't pay for our house in Ashburn. And so I was just wondering if I was gonna end up in the homeless ministry earlier. And so, <laughs> and somebody called me, hey, I sent you 60. I'm like, oh, thank you. And then I opened my mail, and it was, it was $60,000. They meant $60,000. You think that was a game-changer day for me? You know, uh, every one of these, I could do a whole series on God's faithfulness in my life. And this board always gets updated. There's always new stuff he's doing. There's my aneurysm there he cured. So many different things I can point to. His faithfulness. I could brag on him all day long, and we'd come back, and I'll do some more. Here's... Uh, Application number one for everybody here. If you don't have one of these, I encourage you, make a faith board. Put little things on it that you're gonna see that represent God's faithfulness in your life. Things he's done, prayers he's answered. So you don't forget. Because when we forget, we're like the other 10 guys that are afraid to move forward. But when we remember, we're like Joshua and Caleb and we bust forward. People be naming their kids after us. God's asking us, do you trust me in 2018? What have I done previously in your life? Do you remember it? Now, the funny thing about that, when we kind of stop and remember, I think there's another side to this where God's saying, uh, uh, there's another exercise in addition to this idea of uh, a faith board, what he's done in our past, where we're called to think about our future. God calls us to dream what he wants to do in our lives. You know, when he says in, to Isaiah, I, I wanna do a new thing with you, Years ago, I heard about this. Uh, my wife came home from this workshop and said, I learned all about this thing called a vision board about God's future, what he has for us. So I'm gonna ask Sandra to come on up and talk a little bit about this idea of a vision board. But she came home all excited and said, uh, I, wanna, uh, I wanna stop and pray and ask God to speak to my future and I'm gonna build a board for the future. And I felt like she was competing with my board. I had mine in the bathroom and she came home. I'm gonna put mine up in the bathroom. I'm like, you do yours on your side. Yours is for the future, mine's the past. And Go ahead, Sandra. Come, come tell us a little bit about what is a vision board. So a few years ago, as he said, I was challenged to make this vision board. And when I first heard about it, I thought, oh, this is a fad. It's on the, you know, all in the self-help books. But then I thought, you know, throughout the scripture, God asks to create a visual representation of what he's done for us, like the Ebenezer stones. And then what about a representation of where he's taking us? So I use this as a time to pray and ask the Lord to speak into first my identity, who I am, the names he has for me, um, and then my purpose and what he's created me to do and how I fit into his plan. So I prayed and asked the Holy Spirit to guide me and I would cut out pictures and put them on my board and then I put them up in my house and every day I would look at this board and I would pray into that as a reminder of um, his plan that he had for me. So um, year after year, I would take that down and I would create a new one and the cool thing was that I could take it down and create a new one because he actually fulfilled those things in my life. And it was awesome to be able to use that also as part of my journey of remembrance, to thank him as a reminder that he is faithful, especially during those times when I get down or depressed and you know the enemy's voice is so loud, I can look and say, hey, no, this is what God did and he, um, he has great things in store for me. So... Um, one of the things on my vision board Will wanted me to share, um, I had put up there that I wanted, to, that I really felt God calling me to bring a group of women from various denominational churches together because I, I really believe that we're stronger together and that we can do more for the kingdom together. So I felt that he had put that on my heart and I had this picture of women from um, the Catholic church, from you know the Baptists, the Assemblies of God, all different non-denominational churches coming together and worshiping Christ. And um, this past April, that came to fruition, and it was so cool to hear all of these different speakers come forward and share from the different churches and to hear we all have the same thing in common, Jesus. And it was, um, it, it was just great to be able to take my vision board down this year and say, look at what God did. So you know, after this started happening for a few years, I thought, well, I should invite other people into this, you know, let, let's encourage and pray for each other um, 
as we all, you know, pray for what God has for us. And and it was so cool after the workshops that I started doing with some friends of mine, um, people like Kimberly Shane that came out of that and is starting a young woman's home for women that are coming out of difficulty. She wants to love on them, counsel them, mentor them. And, and that's, it's so cool to see that in the works. And my friend Jen McCann that came out of that workshop wanting to share her passion and is being asked to speak at conferences to help people discover their why and their God-given purpose. So um, I believe there is something significant to seeing uh, what God has for you every single day and not forgetting um, his purpose that he has for you on a daily basis. And then, as Sandra said, she kind of hung hers up when she saw them. They kind of moved from the vision board to the faith board when she saw God answer them. Isn't that kind of amazing? Uh, I, I was there that night. She dragged me. Even, I tried to get out of it because it was an all-women's event. And she's like, no, 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 you, you men come and serve uh, and move all the chairs and stuff. I'm like, okay. And so uh, what was amazing was she did have somebody speak from every different church. And they shared about how, are, how is Christ helping them in a trial? That was kind of the theme. And then they went out and there was this catered meal. And then they came back into the room and she had us as men adjust all the chairs in circles and you had to sit with people from different churches. It was amazing to see the body come together. And then uh, in addition to that, God gave her this vision that they would go and serve together. So a month later, they had a service project in Leesburg. And they thought, wouldn't it be amazing for those who, those who are outside the church who wonder, why are there so many churches? Do they not get along? to see all the churches working together in the name of Christ. Isn't that something? When you and I stop, we ask the Lord, what do you have for my future? Inform my future. And then put something up that also reminds you of who, who, who God is calling you to become and to be your identity in him, and don't lose sight of that. Continue to pray into those things and ask God, what's that gonna look like? What, where will, where, when will this start? What do you want me to do today in this? Otherwise, we're gonna end up stuck in this place. I don't want my tombstone in this place, do you? I, I wanna show you a video clip, but just to set it up, a lot of you would know this movie or this famous book or musical, Les Mis, but I think it's a great representation that some of us get held up in this place, in this space, for different reasons. Some of us are held up here because we don't believe God's big enough. Or we believe he's big enough, but we don't believe he loves us enough to take us through to the other side. So we stay here. Or we have shame for some sin or something we've done that holds us back. Or we believe a lie that keeps us in here, that God created us to live in this space. And it's not true. I want to show you this scene just to set it up. This guy by the name of Jean Valjean has uh, stolen a, bit, a loaf of bread and he ended up in prison for it. He's finally being released from prison. Once he's released, he goes into this home of a minister. While he's in the home of a minister, he still believes his identity now is a thief. And living out that identity, because he has fear, he thinks, I better steal some stuff. So the scene picks up where he's stealing from the minister that's trying to help him. So check this out. Anybody there? So we'll use wooden spoons. I don't want to hear anything more about it. I'm sorry to disturb you. You caught him. 
But I had my eye on this man. Oh, and... thank God. I'm very angry with you, Jean Valjean. What happened to your eye, Monseigneur? Didn't he tell you he was our guest last night? Oh, yes. After we searched his knapsack and found all this silver, he claimed <laughs> that you gave it to him. Yes. Of course I gave him the silverware. But why didn't you take the candlesticks? That was very foolish. Madame Gillot, fetch the silver candlesticks. They're worth at least 2,000 francs. Why did you leave them? Hurry. Monsieur Valjean has to get going. He's lost a lot of time. Did you forget to take them? Are you saying he told us the truth? Of course. Thank you for bringing him back. I'm very relieved. Release him. You're really letting me go? Didn't you understand the bishop? Madame Gillot, offer these men some wine. They must be thirsty. Thank you. And don't forget. Don't ever forget. You've promised to become a new man. Promise? Why are you doing this? Jean Valjean, my brother, you no longer belong to evil. With this silver, I've bought your soul. I've ransomed you from fear and hatred. And now I give you back to God. What has God forgiven you of? What sins have you committed in your life that you don't want to repeat? Do you carry any shame with that? The enemy would love to beat us up and keep us in this space forever with that. And that bishop character represents the Lord. When he says, I've ransomed you with the silver and given you back to God, to release you to go through the next door, to step into your identity. He can't tell me he doesn't have some fear. It's, it's gonna be unknown territory for him. But if you know the story, he does step into it. And he does trust God enough to step into it. And you and I, brothers and sisters in Christ, we have been ransomed by the blood of Jesus. Amen. And the scripture tells us in 1 John that the blood of Jesus covers all sin. You know why? Because our Heavenly Father is loving. And he longs to give us good gifts. And he longs to call us into a, a life of purpose. I don't think it happens if we don't stop and remember his faithfulness. I know it doesn't happen if we believe a lie about who he is, that he's not a good father, that he's not a loving father, that he doesn't have our best interests at heart. So if you're stuck in a place in this space of shame or you know the door God's calling you to and you don't want to go through it or perhaps you're clutching on to some sin that you think the enemy's lied to you is better than God's promises, I encourage you, leave it in 2017. Step into the next year with the Lord. Step through that door trusting him. I'm going to invite the band to come back up now and kind of set up our time of encounter and worship. But I would like us to do is to ask the Lord. It's the Lord. There's not some magic to the exercise of a faith board to remember his past or a vision board to dream about our future. It's the Lord. He's the hero in these things. He's the one who's saying, let me speak into your future and let me speak about your past. That he would want us to let the former things go because he wants to do a new thing in our lives. So here's my challenge for us. First off, in this time of encounter, to listen, to worship, and say, Lord, speak into my life. Is there something you want me to let go of, to offer to you? Is there something I need to repent of that I've been holding on to that is wrong? And the Lord will forgive you in a second if you offer it to him. And then ask him to inform you about your identity and your future. 
uh, if, you're, if you're not very creative uh, or if you just want to be a part of a team to do this, uh, this week you can take one of these. Sandra's got a bunch of them or they're out there. If you want to do the wor- vision, uh, dream board um, uh, workshop this week, there's some on the, on the table as you're leaving on Thursday night. But I highly encourage you, think about some kind of visual representation of what God's done in your life to remind you of his faithfulness and then another that represents what he's calling you to do and who he's calling you to be, more importantly. But on both of those, we gotta remember, he is in love with you. He has your best interest at heart. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you that you... uh, are nothing like us. That you, while we are created in your identity, you know no sin. You do not have a dark motive. You have our best interests at heart. Help us trust you. I pray that we would not be stuck in limbo, but we would let go of the former things and remember your faithfulness as we ask you, what doors are you calling us to step through? that we might step through those in faith, holding your hand, trusting you for the future because you're a good father and you love us. And we thank you, Father, for what you have planned for us in the future, in Jesus' name. And all God's people said,